I don't want you to confuse me with anyone that's famous or important. Uh, a good landing is one you can walk away from. A really great landing is when you can use the airplane again. Uh, I did not do either of those things, crashing an airplane into the jungle one day. Uh, who I am is the luckiest speaker you will ever see at a podium anywhere you go. And I think after the presentation, you will agree with that. I didn't feel very lucky one day. My aircraft was hit, going down. I couldn't get out. It was too low. And in moments, I knew I was going to die. And it was a very sobering feeling to know that you're about to die and hit the jungle. And it's going to be over. And I thought, well, I've done everything I could do. And a little calm came over you at the last minute. And I thought, it'll all be over in a heartbeat. It'll be an explosion. Instantaneous, painlessly, I'll wake up in heaven. And the next thing I remember was a great deal of fire and smoke and heat and flames. And I... <laughs> I thought maybe I didn't go the way I, I thought I was going to go. <laughs> Recognizing I was still alive, I, I got myself out of the plane. And if you want heroes in my story, you're going to have to wait till the movie comes out. The special forces guys have found me, got me out of there. They, that, those were the real heroes. And they, I, I remember just one moment of that. I'll tell you, they couldn't get a helicopter to come in there. It was like too far. We're out of gas. You're too close to Cambodia. It's not our sector. And I thought, this is not the, the movies I watched as a kid. Uh, the hero is down. We need to uh, rescue. I finally got an army chopper on uh, frequency and uh, you know you can talk army people into just about anything if you try <laughs> and uh, sure enough we got him down there and he said I can't I can't put it down uh, there's not enough clearance uh, the rotor the, I'll lose my crew this is too dangerous there and these guys were so dedicated in getting that pilot out of, the, out of the jungle that day the guy hovering over me pointed his M16 at the chopper very clearly on the radio said you either put it down or we'll shoot it down <laughs> and I thought at that moment I am on the right team of players <laughs> the next thing we heard was I, I think we can put it down um, <laughs> never landed the helicopter uh, orbited just a few feet over the hovered a few feet over the uh, ground and they stuffed me in like a sack of potatoes and flew me back and they said he's gonna die before you get him across the Pacific so send him to Okinawa let him die there we'll ship him home in a box and that was that was my my fate that day next thing you know I'm in Okinawa for two months I would like to tell you I was in intensive care for two months I would like to tell you that I was very brave and heroic and uh, courageously uh, fought the pain and uh, be a big fat lie I was a big baby I was cursing my attendants every day crying and screaming and praying to God every night please you have the wrong guy I can't do this my body went from 180 pounds of raw steel, as you see today, uh, <laughs> to 119 pounds of blood and gauze. And they said, if you lose another quarter of a pound, we cannot save you. We can't put IVs in your arms. You're too badly damaged, uh, injured. And I got to a point where I didn't even want to live. Now, this is a horrible f admission from a guy who goes all over the world as an inspirational speaker, but I'd be lying if I, if I said it was any other way. And I, w I just kind of was giving up. And uh, there has to be a turning point to every story, of course. And uh, mine was kind of a silly thing, but, uh, but yet an impactful thing in the way I was thinking. And I was laying there one day looking out the third floor window in Okinawa, and I could see the end of the runway at Kadena. I could see the soccer field where the kids were playing every afternoon. It was April, and I could hear them out there kicking the ball and playing. And I saw the beach, and, the, and I thought, boy, I was those kids once. I, I'd love to be back out there and have a life. And I, I'm just at such a young age. I'm, I'm my life's pretty much over. And at that moment of you know, despair, Judy Garland came on the radio singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. <laughs> How many of you know the words to that song? Anybody? No, you don't. Put your hands down. <laughs> you thought you did, just like I did. It's from The Wizard of Oz. It's a great song. Like, no, 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 no. That is not a kid song. That is not a silly movie song. That is a philosophically adult concept song about daring to dream about dreams coming true that song is so deep when you actually listen to the words for the first time the words penetrated my brain that day sharper than any scalpel the surgeons were using and I thought it isn't about that pot of gold I could look out the window and see the other side of the rainbow and those kids uh, kicking a soccer ball and I thought I'm changing my attitude tomorrow. I'm going to try to eat the food. The thing was, I just, my body was rejecting food. I am going to try tomorrow. I have a new attitude. I've turned my whole, God, it's okay. Forget all that stuff I said for 30 days. I'm, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And the next day they came in with uh, the food. And you know, isn't it amazing? They could see it in my face, in my eyes. Isn't it amazing how a change of attitude in the slightest way in your life can affect the whole rest of your life? Attitude's everything. 
education, being brilliant, uh, the material things, uh, it, all that's great. Skills, great. Knowledge is great. But you got to put them in the right direction. And I had the attitude. And, and they came in and I couldn't eat the food. It wouldn't go down. And they were beside themselves because they say he's really trying now. We want to save this guy. He's, he looks like hell, but he's, he's got that look on his face now like he is not giving up. And they couldn't, the food wouldn't go down. And he said, you're going to die. Finally, an army corpsman had a sack lunch his wife packed. He said, maybe, maybe there's something in here, anything. They were desperate. And there was, there was nothing except a small plastic container of cherry Kool-Aid. <laughs> and the cherry Kool-Aid went down real good. <laughs> and they ran to the commissary and they got every pack of cherry Kool-Aid they could find. <laughs> and I drank 3.2 gallons of cherry Kool-Aid <laughs> the first day. I lived on four to five gallons of Kool-Aid a day for five days. And uh, got some, uh, well I peed real good. Uh, what I, and they said that's even a better sign. Your body's functioning and it's internally working. It just needs nourishment. Then crackers, then bread. Next thing you know I was eating. Next thing you know I was medevac back home. And I'm not, not here today because of cherry Kool-Aid. I'm here today because I changed my attitude and I changed my direction of thinking. And that's, that's so important in life. When, we, when I used to teach fi young fighter pilots, the attitude's everything. I'll teach you the stick and rudder, but if you don't have the right attitude, you're going to kill yourself anyway. Got back to the States, spent a year in the hospital. I'm not going to bore you with all that tonight. We have more fun things to talk about. Popped out of the hospital one day, much to the shock of the U.S. Air Force. It said, I'm sure he's never coming back and never going to fly again. They said, oh, we, I guess we got to take him back. He passed the physical, which was a miracle in itself. <laughs> If you don't think I am already the luckiest person in the world at this point in the story, then you're, you're not listening. And a little blue car pulled up to the hospital and I got to go back to the Air Force and, and be a pilot again. But what I took back with me out of that experience was, it was like I was starting life over. It was like I was reborn. So I was like a two-year-old now, going back. I'm two years old. Now, having a two-year-old in the squadron makes colonels very nervous. <laughs> it makes other people very excited because we're enthused. We'll try anything. We're fearless. When I got out of my hospital experience, I learned a lot. But the, the basic things I'll share with you tonight, one was live fearlessly. What are we waiting for? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Two, life is short and it's uncertain. And because it's both, how can you miss the opportunity of each day? And thirdly, fearlessly pursue your passion in life. Don't wait, put it off. Do it now. Don't care what everyone else says. Don't care if they laugh at you. Don't have that fear. Well, I'm not very good. I don't do that very well. I don't have enough money. I don't. Forget all that. The day I could not be laying in a burn ward anymore, I was going to run like a locomotive. If I fall down, fine, at least I'm still moving. So I had this new attitude. Went back in the Air Force, flew jets. That was a big story in the Air Force, which I did not want to be. It was very embarrassing to flash your big fat scarred up face across Airman Magazine and, oh, this is great. The guy came back to fly. It made me very uncomfortable. I wasn't ready to be a rock star over uh, leaving your jet in the jungle. I, what was your big accomplishment? Nothing. You survived. But deep down inside, I knew that I'd learned a great, great lesson. So I was a man carrying a camera around all the time because camera uh, photography was my passion. And who knew what it would lead to? Point to any successful person today in any job that you think, and you'll find someone that has a love and a passion for what they do. They just love, you know, Bill Gates, he's, a, he's an idiot to want to sit with and have coffee with. You wouldn't want to talk to him. He's so boring. But the guy has a love and a passion for what he does. And, oh, guess what? He's just slightly successful. <laughs> I had a love and a passion for flying and just doing and being and being so alive. So I was like a two-year-old in the squadron. Fast forward to one day, I said, well, I'd like to fly the world's fastest jet. And uh, they said, well, you were lucky enough to get back, back into flying, but uh, we don't think that you're, you're ready for that because you've got to breathe 100% oxygen in a spacesuit while you're flying the world's fastest jet. And uh, we, just, we just don't know about all the scar tissue thing because you're like the first guy that came in. And I looked at him and I said, again, they're terrified because they're adults. I was a 12-year-old when I got to this plane. I was 12. <laughs> And I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, attention, I went into surgery 15 times and, oh, they were giving me 100% oxygen every time, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I scored the sixth highest score they ever had on the astronaut physical at Travis Air Force Base because I was motivated. They put me on that treadmill like this and I, I was running, to, uh, my heart was beating, the guy said, damn. Nobody's gotten to that level. He says, I'm just playing with you now. He says, I just, you know, I just want to see you drop dead here. And uh, 
He said, you know what's funny? He says, you had no internal injuries. Your, your internal structure was so strong that went through that, it's almost like it was like it had a workout or something and it's so strong now that, yeah, you're, externally you look like you're, you're, you're weak or bad or things, but internally, he said, geez, so next thing you know, I get to fly the world's fastest jet. Now, that, that, up to that point in the story, that'll make a great movie someday, I'm sure. I'm sure, you know, Tom Cruise is gearing up for that role or somebody. <laughs> What's oh, so funny? Uh, <laughs> for those of you that are unfamiliar with the world's fastest jet, in this audience probably there's not too many, but uh, fastest aircraft ever built. This was your guardian of freedom for 25 years, built back in the early 60s. Gary Powers was shot down in 1960 in the U-2. President Eisenhower went to Lockheed, said, build me an airplane they can't shoot down. 18 months later, they roll out an SR-71. Wow. That wasn't 18 years. F-35 people, that was uh, 18 months. <laughs> this, uh, <coughs> anyway, back then you could do things like that. Not only was it the world's fastest, highest flying aircraft ever built, it was built out of titanium. You can't forge titanium, they had to hand build each one. But they wanted an airplane that, that could spy on the other side with impunity and not be shot down. We cruised around at 2,000 knots. If you fired a high-powered hunting rifle, the bullet exits the muzzle at 3,100 feet per second. This aircraft would cruise with ease in a climb at 3,200 feet per second. The aircraft had, had a crew of two, pilot and a navigator. As a pilot, I got to ride in the front seat, which I thought was a very good place to put me. <laughs> the jet was way ahead of its time. O they only built about 35 of the strategic reconnaissance versions that were just for cameras, no weapons at all. Only 93 men in history got to fly this airplane. I always felt like I appreciated it more than the other 92. And only one guy in history was carrying a camera around. Least photographed jet in history. Not allowed to take pictures, top secret, all this stuff, and, and it was. But if you were around the airplane long enough, you could get permission, get approval, get the signature, uh, and do it, because it was a passion. I didn't know I was going to be a guest speaker, write books, or do any of this stuff. I just knew I'm near the most elegant aircraft ever built. I, I even have been doing this. How can you miss the opportunity if you're into your photography? And, you, and I didn't have any idea what I would do with those Kodachrome slides. This is back in manual, camera, manual, everything. 35 roll, 36 to a roll. This was the jet that gave way to no other airplane when it taxied out. This jet served six different presidents, did more to help win the Cold War than you will ever know. This airplane, I was crewed with uh, Walter Watson, uh, as we already introduced his brother-in-law here today. Walter's the one on the left. Hey, uh, <laughs> Walter has the distinction of being the only black officer in Air Force history to be a part of this program, and he wears that title proudly, speaks at many uh, events around on his own. Sometimes we do shows together. We do a two-hour thing called Spy uh, Pilot Chronicles, kind of fun. Walter was a brilliant engineer. We're best friends to this day. We, I just talked to him yesterday. That man was brilliant in the back seat and you needed somebody in that back seat to be brilliant. We wore the same kind of spacesuits like the shuttle astronauts did. They in fact used our suits for the first shuttle mission back in, in 1980. Uh, so it, we had, you're flying above 90,000 feet. You're flying at about 85,000 feet at 2,000 knots. This is what my cockpit looked like, your basic 57 Chevy. There's nothing cosmic about this. <laughs> First time I got in the plane, I said, oh my God, I feel a little naked. No guns, no bombs, no rockets. Uh, well, at least I can flip a camera switch on and feel like I'm doing my part. No, no, nothing in the front seat. Walter had all the cameras, all the sensors, all the calm jamming and all. My job was to keep the pointy end forward. <laughs> and that was a full-time job in this airplane. I told Walt, hey, if we're ever shot down, you're the spy, I'm just the driver. <laughs> Now getting used to the space helmet did take a little, a little getting used to, yet that was kind of different. As a fighter pilot, you can take your uh, oxygen mask off in flight, scratch your face, wipe sweat out of your eye, or if you're a Navy pilot, pick your nose, or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is they do. <laughs> Pensacola, I love it. <laughs> But now, you were entombed all the time for the next five, six hours. You're breathing 100% oxygen and you just hear yourself breathing. So now the helmet well, was a little different. And they told you, watch out what you eat before you go because as you know, as you go higher in elevation, the evolved gases in your stomach expand. So if you eat a real gassy meal or something, you, you know, if you've been hiking in the mountains behind the guy that ate the plate of beans, you know what happens as you get, all right. So I, I was a new guy one day and they were kind of playing with me and they said, hey Brian, have the ham and cheese omelet in the flight kitchen. It's very good. In fact, 
have extra cheese because the protein will be really good for you for that long mission. I go, oh, that sounds good. Protein, cheese, okay, pile it on. Passing 52,000 feet in the climb that day, I thought I was going to give live birth to in the cockpit. <laughs> And Walt's go, are you okay? What's wrong? And I, I'm making noises. And finally, at 71,000 feet in the climb, I, I very tearfully realized just how self-contained that entire uh, suit is, <laughs> as relief came. Uh, so uh, you had to be very careful about what you ate. You had a little heating and cooling knob here for hot and cold. You were, you were always too hot or too cold. There was never any comfortable. Uh, but you'd sit in that seat anywhere from three to six hours on an average uh, mission. Uh, here we are getting ready to fly. Much more fun in the front seat. Got a view, got a window. Uh, Walter's back there working the, the, the navigation system, working the, the, all the cameras and sensors. and all. It's a really full time and he was just a brilliant guy. Had the best backseater in the squatter. But if you look closely at our, our flight suits here, before we fly, it, mine kind of has a happy face on it. <laughs> Wal Walter, not so much. <laughs> now, we only had 15 uh, pilots in the squadron at any one time. I was out of the country six months out of the year. We had three locations that flew spy missions to cover the entire world geopolitically. Okinawa, two jets. England, two jets. Beale Air Force Base near Sacramento, California, the 12, 13 jets. That, that was our main base. So we'd rotate for six, seven weeks at a time. You could just read the paper and see what was going on and know where the SR was flying. Oh, Honduras now is having problems. Oh, Cuba just got MiGs. Oh, uh, East Germany is moving missiles. And you didn't, it wasn't any secret. And you're not hiding a 900 degree Fahrenheit heat source from anyone. They knew you were there. <laughs> they knew you were coming. They tracked you all the time. They just got tired of taking shots at you and not hitting you, and they got embarrassed. The Soviets finally, finally kind of quit. Over 4,000 missiles were fired at this plane in 25 years. Not one, not one piece of one was ever hit. This is Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. One day, uh, Ronald Reagan, who was our commander in chief, who knew how to use this airplane effectively, we always thought, knew that the communists were having a big conference up in North Korea and they invited all the bad guys here. The Chinese, the Soviets, the Vietnamese, the Koreans, they were all there. They didn't invite us. <laughs> Ronald Reagan had Walter and I take off out of Kadena, go up to Korea, and we're flying figure eight butterfly patterns over the conference. And we're going, what are we doing? We have photographed the entire country in the first four minutes. <laughs> but we'd go back out over the sea of Japan, come back doing, and, and it was Ronald Reagan's way of sonic booming their coffee cup off the desk <laughs> at their conference every four minutes just to let them know we know you're there and now you know we're here and you can't do a thing about it. Uh, the jet carried a double sonic boom one off the nose and one off the spikes, the inlets. And if you ever heard, uh, heard one, it was a baboom. Uh, it was uh, pretty impressive. A little footnote to history you may not be aware of. Behind the jet here is the Kadena Marina where the, the Navy has a little officer's club and people are surfing and wind sail wind surfing and sailing, learning how to sail and learning how to windsurf. And rumor has it, and I, I, I don't know how true this is, but that some SR-71 pilots on takeoff would suck the wheels up 10 feet off the deck and full burner go ripping across that marina and knocking wind surfers over. And I, I think that's just a rumor, um, personally. <laughs> it's one of my favorite all-time pictures. Uh, very difficult to get the jet all completely in, in the picture. It's uh, that moody England countryside. It's a dark, a cold uh, winter day. And you can see the smoke. The jets, you can only run up one engine at a time. It's so powerful. They, they, it, within about 30 seconds, this guy's going to be taken off on a real mission. You always had a mobile car with a couple people in it, run down the runway, make sure there's no debris. So my passion was the photography. And every chance I could get, I wanted to get a picture for reasons I didn't even know, except I knew I wanted to do it. And as a 12-year-old, I, you know, would, would push the limits. And uh, this, all the photographs that you're seeing today, represent the world's rarest collection of blackbird photography anywhere. They're all my own images. And I wasn't a great photographer. I didn't know what the word aperture meant on my camera. But I'm sitting in the mobile car this day with the colonel, not Walter, the colonel. And we're watching this incredible scene of them running up and the whole earth is shaking and there's just a jet just leaning over and then they run the other one. It's like a tiger on a leash. It's a magnificent scene. You just can't take your eyes off it. And he looks over and he said, what's that camera doing on the seat? And of course, as a 12-year-old, I go, huh? What? Me? <laughs> You're talking to me? Uh, 
Hey, camera. I, yeah, I didn't. Whew, I don't know how that got there. <laughs> and then he looked back at the jet, and he's like kind of upset. And uh, he said, you know you're not supposed to have that camera out here. And I go, oh, well, yeah, of course, but now it's too late. We're here, and uh, you know, I don't think it caused the world the situation here. And without even taking his eyes off the plane, he, he, you know, uh, we're just staring. I said, you know, sir, that would be an incredible picture in your office. <laughs> Now, every guy that ever flew the plane never had great pictures in the office because you just you got that same old Lockheed picture, Lockheed photos. And he never even looked at me. He just said, you got 10 seconds. <laughs> I got out on the runway, put in, and, and I, I tell this story because I really didn't know what I was doing photographically. I was just uh, passionate about the, the, the scene and the, my little Nikon F3 and the, that stupid aperture thing, whatever it was. And I, I had this zoom lens and it allowed me to get the whole plane you just it's just so hard it's an angular uh, plane I got down on the runway at 10 seconds and I didn't even know if I really focused it or not people love this picture we made a big one at home in my gallery they go wow that's real photography there I go if you only knew how it was taken and it's a great example of my entire theory about loving uh, what you do you never heard one take off? Your life's incomplete, I'm sorry. Uh, this was a sound that penetrated your skeletal frame and just went right through your body. The uh, best I can relate it to is the funny cars at a drag race when you get up too close to them and you feel it you know, pounding you. Uh, I loved it. I loved the sound of it every day. Uh, we called it the sled, the blackbird, the habu for the black snake in Okinawa. Uh, I don't want to make any Cessna drivers feel bad here tonight, but uh, from brake release to 26,000 feet leveling subsonic at 450, Three minutes, 51 seconds. Um, I think that's about three days in a Cessna. I'm not sure. <laughs> <coughs> it gets better. You know? <laughs> got the Navy, got the Cessnas. Okay, we're going. Uh, if you're going to go that fast, you're going to you burn a lot of gas, and you're going to have to refuel two to five times in any given mission. You got to come down. You got at 290, we fall out of the sky. You're taking on 65,000 pounds of fuel, changing your gross weight by 65,000 pounds. You're going to slide off the boom. You're going to light one burner to stay on. You're going to fly sideways. All that every time. Those guys could barely give you 300 knots. If they gave you 305, you were in heaven. You were so happy. Uh, you try this at night, in a turn. In turbulence, in a storm, you just, they, they, it's an insanity. It's like landing uh, on carriers at night in the Navy. I, I respect those guys so much for doing that because this, this was like kind of our crucible. Now you may say to yourself, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that illegal to do acrobatics in a refueling area? How'd you get that picture? Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going back. That is such an incredible shot. Really, you, you will never see that picture. I was with the Air Force photographer one day. They needed someone to fly the Air Force photographer. He said, you guys have been photographed once in 25 years. We're, we're going to do an Airman Magazine thing. So who would, who would like to fly the Air Force photographer? Well, I ran over three guys and I said, no. <laughs> and, and then we got airborne. I said, hey, Sarge, I got, I got my camera today. You want to take the stick and a little bit here? I went, and he goes, wow, you're going to let me fly? Oh, he was so excited. So, so we, did do a, we did do a little, uh, a little extra there. But it gives you an idea of the size of the airplane. It's a big airplane, carried 80,000 pounds of gas. And you are basically a flying fuel tank. And you're going to burn through that gas uh, at those speeds. Now, my days off, I'd go up with the tanker guys to get, just to see it and get a picture. I, don't ask me why. And people would tell me, what a pain in the butt that is. You got to get approval. You got to get signed off. You have to go up four hours earlier, orbit out there on that barf bucket. And then you got to go back there with the, with the boomer. And you got to lean over and try to get a picture. It's so much. It's just a big pain. And I'd look at them and say, pain? Pain is laying in a burn ward where they're ripping skin off one part of your body to sew it on another part. Now you got a new wound on your body and you're sitting under a heat lamp in the middle of the day trying to heal a wound you didn't even have and you're, so, you're like a, at 130 pounds and you're so miserable you want to throw up but you can't. I said, this is living. How could you miss it? Now, I didn't say that. I just looked at them like, God, they're such adults. They don't get it. How could they miss it? <laughs> Coming off the tanker, one of, this is another one, it's Rembrandt lighting. People go, wow, this guy knew what he was doing. Photo. That must be National Geographic. No, that's B. Shul. What the hell does Aperture mean on my camera? I still don't know. <laughs> got back there at the boomer one day. He says, all right, I'm only going to let you get, you got 10 seconds, another one of these. You got five seconds, you know, and I'm zooming. They bank 12 degrees, early morning sun over the South China Sea. You get to see the fuel sloshing out across the wing. The jet was built to leak subsonically. Rare, you won't see pictures like this too often. That's the fuel seeping out of the expansion joints. When we heated up to 900 degrees, the jet sealed like Tupperware. You didn't lose a drop. 
But subsonic, the jet was always dripping and oozing fuel. It was like it was alive. It was just oozing. And that's, that's people say, wow, that's Rembrandt light. Look, that's, that's just incredible. It must be time life, you know, photographer guy. And again, we didn't know for three weeks what you got, you know, photographic. One of my favorite, favorite pictures. Um, leaving the tanker, you're passing 50,000 feet. The sky turns a very deep, dark blue, and you're above all that weather you feared when you flew mortal planes all those years. <laughs> Leveling at 84,000 feet, you look out and you say exactly what you just said. And as the 12 year old I said, I gotta get a picture of this. And so I, I went back in the books and the regs, I said, is there anything illegal about carrying a camera in the cockpit? And you're not gonna believe this, but the entire uh, book, the be no book, you know, there'll be no uh, uh, this or that, <laughs> never once addressed uh, while flying the world's most sophisticated spy plane, uh, probably a good idea not to have a camera in your hand taking a picture while you do it. And I took that to mean, well, of course it'd be okay. Uh, otherwise, they would have written it in there. <laughs> I, mean, I got myself a small Instamatic, put it in, on a lanyard in my spacesuit pocket. Very difficult to do. I'd sit in the hangar. Th you're going to get a kick out of this. I don't know any other guys that flew this jet. And I mean, I was in love with doing it. I, I think you know I had a passion for it. I'd sit in the, ha in the hangar. On, the, on a Saturday when we're in Kadena and then the crew chiefs would go, yeah, we're working on stuff. Yeah, it's in the, and I'd practice the camera thing. Because when you're in that spacesuit, everything is, is, is much harder to do. You can't focus, has to be auto, everything. I got maybe six pictures like this in seven years. So not an easy, not on real missions. These are all training missions. Trust me, when you're flying a real mission, there was no, no photography going on. But to this day now, I have those six pictures and I'm glad I can share with the world what that was like. Uh, and it was a beautiful thing. It took your breath away when you looked out. This is what the Arctic Circle looks like. And you might think, well, who are we spying up there? Polar bears? And, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the Soviets put some new missiles up there one day and we went to go uh, test, uh, see, see what they could do. And they send uh, us up there like we're kind of guinea pigs, like, uh, you know, they might shoot one at you, so now we'll know what they do. Um, I saw two sunrises and two sunsets on that uh, particular mission. It was winter time. Uh, I already admitted to you I was a big baby in the hospital. I'll admit, I'll admit something else to you. I, uh, I used to look in the mirror some days. I put the green visor up just to see that I was really doing this. I checked the scarred face and I'd go, you are not dreaming this. Because in the hospital they gave me some drugs sometimes for pain. That you'd have dreams like you're flying or something. Then you'd wake up and go, no, nah, it was just a dream. I actually had to see myself every night. I thought, you are, just 12 years ago, you were there. You are now doing this. <laughs> and it was yeah, a kind of a childish, well, thing a 12-year-old would do. But uh, I really had to, had to think and stop in my life and say, wow, you, you are sitting on the, the tip, tip of the sword. Put the camera up there on auto timer. Did this just an incredibly lucky, rare shot. The glare of the sun is just very uh, uncooperative for photography uh, in the cockpit. People always ask me, what were your favorite missions and all? This was one of, I have several. The coast of Vietnam, we got to go back over the very spot where I was shot down uh, of 12 years earlier, and Walt and I laid down some sonic boom that day, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> and it was pretty darn cool, you know, uh, to come into the officer's club on a Friday afternoon with your M3 plus patch on, stand up to the bar and all the guys with the toy, the toy jets, you know, the F-15, F F-16, <laughs> yeah. they're all talking, you know, and uh, my instructor one day uh, comes in and we're there standing, you know, seeing all these guys, and they're eyeballing our patch, you know, and they know what to say. He goes, he stops the whole conversation with this remark, he goes, yeah, I did Nebraska in eight and a half minutes today. <laughs> And I just want to tell you, that's the best way to do Nebraska, by the way. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't driven through there. Sometimes uh, we'd say a little prayer to him who holds all of us in his hands. And I always thought prayers got to heaven a little faster from 90,000 feet, which was a very good thing because there were no minor emergencies. When anything happened in this airplane, this is sunrise over Iceland. We took a jet from Sacramento to London one day, which was a three and a half hour flight. Uh, zipped across the Arctic Circle, got over to Iceland to hit the tanker, and the sun was right in your eyes the whole time. But uh, I was lucky enough to have my little camera in my pocket. Coming back over Mount uh, Lassen, just south of Shasta, a, up in a T-38 chase aircraft where I had a lot. Of, I was an instructor, so I got a lot of opportunity there with another pilot in the plane uh, to do these kind of pictures. And again, you just had moments to do it. You never had enough time to do them. Sometimes the last 10 minutes of flight was the absolute worst. You were up there for five hours in the clear blue, you know, you come back, the weather's changed. All of a sudden, you, you took off on a sunny day and it's socked in now, and you have fuel for one approach. They planned your missions. You, your job was to make gas. 
uh, you're coming across the fence at 185. You're not landing real slow. You, so you get, don't mess it up. So sometimes those last few minutes, you, you got really good. Now, if you want more than your 15 minutes of fame in life, you be an SR-71 pilot. Take your jet to a major air show where there's 100,000 people. Fly your jet over that show. Light the burners in their face. Land your jet at their show. Stand in front of the jet at the show. You are a sky god. <laughs> I had the uh, wonderful privilege of representing the United States Air Force and the SR-71 at the Dayton Air Fair, the Paris Air Show. Uh, I did the opening at Reno when I think we pretty much won our heat. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, England where they used to get hundreds of thousands at an air show. And air if your jet's there, they everyone's coming to see it. It's the one airplane that was like like the meeting the Pope it was like they'd stand in awe and they'd look at it afraid to speak then they'd look at you and they couldn't speak then they'd look at the jet and finally we go hey we're just Air Force pilots we're not we're not special astronauts or CIA guys we're just Air Force regular guys doing doing a really neat thing finally when they uh, you'd hear the same questions over they were kind of outrageous like oh, when you go into orbit do you shut the engines down well, we, we don't go into orbit <laughs> The magnificence of this airplane is that it's not a rocket, it's an air-breathing jet. And for it to be able to do what it did, and I recommend you read the Skunk Works and, and the Kelly Johnson story, was a phenomenal achievement to build this at all. Well, it's an air-breathing jet. But you know, after you heard that question a number of times, you had to play with them a little bit, and I'd, one day I'd, I, got, I was all hot and tired and sunburned out there. I said, uh, the guy said, uh, well, you go into orbit. And I said, all right, come here. I'm going to tell you something, but you can promise it's so classified. You can't tell anybody. <laughs> and he goes, no, no, I won't tell anyone at all. They're just so, they're so excited to be a part of the mission. I said, uh, when we're on the backside of the moon, we shut one engine down. <laughs> And we use the moon's gravity to sling us back. To, and he's just, his eyes are this big. And I said, but you can't tell. That's a very high level. He could, no, no. And he ran back to his family and told them everything. And, uh, <laughs> so it was kind of fun. If you were a Blackbird pilot, you also got to fly Baby Jet, the T-38 here over Lake Tahoe, as a uh, little companion trainer to stay current in formation, instrument, night flying. But it was more fun. Now, Walter and I could go out together for crew coordination. Hey, it was just, here's the sports car, go out for an hour, fly around. And Walter, Walter was having, I was teaching him uh, how to fly. He had a stick now and a real view. Here, here's Walt demonstrating straight and level flight. Um, <laughs> We had the most beautiful flying area from Mount Shasta to Yosemite. Is a piece of geography if you, you flatlander folks in Florida aren't aware of. It is a magnificent, uh, Lake Tahoe's in the middle of that. And we would fly around, so of course camera boy could not resist and people always gave me such heat like, well, you got the camera again? These are the same people that today have called me and said, can I, can I get a print for my home? I, I'm really proud that I did that one day and now I have no pictures of it. And I've, of course, I'm happy to send them one. But uh, we, we really enjoyed the little sports car and Walt and I had a lot of fun. But what we really used it for was a, a safety chase. Here the SR-71 has an emergency right after takeoff. It's dumping fuel to lighten its gross weight so it can land immediately. The T-38 is going to offer a safety assistant chase. Uh, we just happened to be airborne that day and someone just happened to be have a camera and that's a rare shot of the two of them together you rarely see. Uh, and we don't like to dump fuel that low. Uh, the rice crop in California did taste a little different that year. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's only one picture in tonight's show completely that I will say that is an actually, uh, uh, I knew what I was doing as a good photo. That is a tremendous photo because somebody figured out what the word aperture meant. <laughs> this is in year 20. I'm getting ready to retire. One of my last few flights in the T-38 were over Mammoth Lakes and I said, alright guys, I've got this figured out. i got a cable release. I can put my arm down. I can snap the picture. I can see you in my little uh, Nikon lens. I took my gloves off, stuffed the camera. It was just a real setup. And I'm in focus, the jet's in focus, the mountains are in. That is a dang good picture. It was such a good picture that some company in New York City picked it up, made a puzzle out of it, they, they made a poster, and they said, do you have any other photos of any other, other jets there? And all of a sudden, when I was getting out of the Air Force, doors started opening at precisely the right time, precisely the right way that, that I could never imagine, only, only wish for. Uh, as my mom always said, and she sent me this sign, says, uh, uh, I, we don't believe in miracles, we just count on them. And, and that's kind of how I felt. That same year, 1990, that I got out of the Air Force, the world's greatest jet was being retired, 1990. 
the most remarkable aircraft of the 20th century. The way it was built, what it did, and what it did for this nation. It was, it was undefeated. It was the jet that did the mission it was intended to better than anything else. 1962, the first models were built. 64, the first, this one was built. You're sitting here today in 2015, it still holds every speed and altitude record. That is an amazing uh, fact. Well, that was a very sad day. Uh, they started flying jets off the base, one by one. They're in 30 museums today, and one at a time, jets just started, started leaving Beale, and it was really sad. And there came a really sad day when the last jet departed, and it was the end of an era. I would have taken more pictures that day, but tears welled up in your eyes as you realized you were saying goodbye to a legend that you would never see the likes of again. Every MiG fighter pilot knew this silhouette wanted to be first to shoot one down. When Victor Belenko defected, he said, we could not understand how your decadent Mickey Mouse capitalist society could build an airplane in the 60s that we couldn't shoot down in the 90s. And the general got right in his face like a baseball umpire, and he said, that's what you can do in a country where men are free. Well, that was just great. Yeah, it was a great moment of American history there. And uh, they, he became an American citizen. Victor Blanco gave us the MiG-25. So we built the MiG-25 for one purpose. Shoot that damn airplane down. <laughs> and he gave us one. He said, I, so he became an American citizen. And they said, what would you like to see? He said, only two things. Disneyland and an SR-71 up close. <laughs> and we said, yeah, pal, that's the closest you ever got to one. <laughs> Leaving Air Force history, passing through the gates of legend. If you have not seen one in, in a museum, there's 30 museums around the country. You got one in Mobile, Alabama, it's pretty close. Um, you do see one. Well, go to Dayton, go to the Air Force Museum, it's really cool. Go to, they are just a remarkable uh, airplane uh, to see. Uh, I got out of the Air Force and uh, had all these pictures, didn't know what to do with them. And now I'm still living that attitude, I'm still living that. Live the dream, pursue your passion fearlessly. Don't, don't worry about everyone says, go fly for the airlines. I didn't want to fly for the airlines. I wanted to ride and hike and do nature stuff. Well, I had all these uh, photographs and uh, I wanted to do a book. People go, ah, you don't know how to write a book, what do you, what do you know? And uh, two years later, me and a couple guys got together and we took a $100,000 loan out of a bank and luckily the guy believed in us. And, we did what is now the single most popular book in the world on the jet, 48 countries. Uh, I'm very proud to say we did it. Uh, I'm the publisher now because the publisher wouldn't do it the way we wanted it done. The er original book it was just really poopy. So <laughs> we wanted horizontal so you could, don't have to chop the pictures up. We wanted a beautiful edition. These are, it cost us a fortune to print these. We print a limited number each year. It is now the one book that you is the rarest collection of photographs to the jet. Uh, this year we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first flight, so we, we came out with a very limited number of gold editions this year. I brought a dozen or so tonight, for those of you that, several of you have already purchased one tonight, thank you. We support the Wounded Warrior pro Program, so your money is going to a good cause. We also minted a coin to commemorate the 50th anniversary. We're the only, Lockheed didn't do it, the association did, we're the only ones that did one, me and my three buddies that, that work at Gallery One. Very proud of that. And uh, at the end tonight, if you come over uh, to the table, I'll be happy to give you a price half of what you see on the internet. They, on the internet tonight, you go down, type in sled driver, you'll see $400, $500 people selling their book and are trying to sell you a book. We're se we'll sell them for $200 uh, tonight, just in uh, my $5,000 signatures, uh, free. <laughs> I will warn you, for those few of you that uh, purchased the book tonight, there are still some photographs that are highly classified that you will not see in the book. <laughs> I'd appreciate it if you did not take any of this classified information out of this room. Uh, I will always be the sled driver guy because of the internet and that book. No matter what else I do in life, I could run for Congress and all, it wouldn't matter. I'll be the sled driver uh, guy and I'm proud, I'm proud of it. That's okay. Um, I went out and I flew with the Thunderbirds. I did a whole a book on winter training for the Thunderbirds and no one's ever done that before. Again, living fearlessly, I called them up and said, yeah, I want to fly with you during winter training. And they go, Brian, you know better now. We don't do that. But I just kept bugging them and finally I saw the leader of the team at an air show one day and he said, hey, my daughter bought me your sled driver book and I love it. Can you do something like that for us? <laughs> and I said, sir, I've been calling you guys for two years. So I went out and here's a little tip. If you fly with the Thunderbirds, don't do it during winter training season. They're not real good yet. And it was <laughs> very scary. Which led to my infamous year with the Blue Angels. No one in history has flown with the team as a civilian an entire year. In fact, you didn't even hear that. Just pretend when you leave here at night, you didn't hear that. I spent a year with the team. Again, I called them 427 times. They said, no, 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 no. 
finally showed up in person at El Centro where they do their winter training. And uh, the guy said, wow, I respect it. You showed up. Uh, what, what is it you want to do? I said, well, I just want to fly with the team for an entire air show season. That's all. And I want you to fly me to and from the shows with the, the C-130 there. Uh, shot 80,000 slides that summer. There's three, pic uh, three jets in that picture. How often do you think those three jets are lined up that well? How often do you think we're lined up with those three? <laughs> Pretty much never. Uh, they called me Air Force Boy for the first six months, but uh, <laughs> it was, a, it was a, the photo shoot of a lifetime. And it, oh, did it happen because I was the best photojournalist in America? No. Was I the best photographer aviation? No, not even close. Was I even remotely known as any? Uh, no. But I was the guy who kept asking the question, who showed up, and fearlessly, you could, I don't care if you say no, then I'll just keep trying. And I did the one book now. I wish I could show that to you. It's out of print. It's, it's sold so well for their 50th anniversary back in 96. We're going to reprint it next year. We're hoping to have, have the book out again. Uh, you may say we look a little close here. You'd be right. That is not a wide angle lens. That is a 55 millimeter normal lens. We're counting rivets. My pilot, uh, my pilot uh, uh, DJ, uh, he, he used to tell me, he said, uh, Air Force boy, your seat's four inches higher than mine, so I'll know when you start crying and squealing like a little girl, I'm too close. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, gee, thanks, Dino. I, uh, that makes me feel much better. But this day, he said, whoa, partner, don't put that in the book. We, we almost hit. Number two moved out too fast. We moved up to And we just, we came within inches. And I mean, I'm like, whoa, your heart stopped. We taxied in that day. I said, hey, Dino, I used to teach this stuff for a living, and I was really good, but you scared me bad twice today. He goes, that's okay, partner. I scared myself three times. <laughs> I will tell you, when you see the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds anywhere, ever, those guys earn your applause. They are not out partying. They are not out. They go into bed at 9 o'clock and at 8 a.m. They're in the weight room. That is the hardest thing to do. It's better, uh, harder than NASCAR racing, the bullfighting. Uh, you name it, I've been there, and I will tell you, that hurts your body and is the most excruciatingly dangerous and difficult thing at, at four feet, of, three feet apart at 500 knots. There's nothing the same about that every day. Turbulence and the sun in your eye and sweat. No, you, you, it's too bad. They've earned your applause and shake their hand if you get a chance. I did my last flying as a, did a calendar project for the Portland Air National Guard over Mount Hood. We call this Eagles in the Hood. Uh, and I hung up my spurs. I quit flying. I said, well, if I can't, I can't do the kind of flying I want to do and do it regularly, um, then I, I just don't want to do it anymore. I wanted to be a nature photographer and concentrate on that. And I went out outdoors and I started walking across the land that I had flown over at breakneck speed, uh, where once I was doing a mile every two seconds, uh, now we were just walking across the land. Um, and I found as a pilot, I took a real affinity to the birds, nature's flyers. And I, the simple seagull that we don't pay attention to, when you actually get to, to observe it, you realize that the perfection of that elliptical wing in nature, and that the countenance of an e bald eagle is so magnificent and fierce, it became the symbol for the greatest nation on earth. And the tiniest little delicate flyer who has a brain the size of a pinhead can navigate from Mexico to Canada every year and has a navigational capability more than anything we've ever developed with all of our technology. And I defy any aerodynamic engineer to diagram the dynamic forces going on when an egret plucks a minnow from that pond. And as a pilot, I have watched these birds for hours and I go, I now understand the real reason man wanted to fly in the first place. And it centers me. It gives my life another chapter of peace and calm after a life of anything but. And people say, well, guess it didn't get any better than that, Brian. Now it had to be like the highlight of your life. I said, well, maybe 1A. My better, didn't get any better than that moment in life was the day I walked out of the hospital down those long concrete steps at Fort Sam Houston on my own legs and a blue car was waiting and they opened the door and I had another chance, an opportunity to go back to life. A million guys didn't come back from that war, the 18, 19 year old, never had a life. They never even got into their 20s. They never had anything. I'm 42 today in my mind, in my brain. I've had 42 extra years that I shouldn't have ever even had. And that was, didn't get any better in that moment for me. Now this was a second maybe, it was pretty cool. And I will just tell you this before I, I end tonight, I will tell you this little story because it's, it's all over the internet. People see it and they send it to me and they write to me and they call me and say, I heard this incredible story about the SR-71, you gotta hear it. And I go like, hey, I wrote that. 
it's in my book. I'm the guy. And they go, no, no, this is different. And I heard it and I go, okay, moron. I wrote it. I'm the guy. So I'm going to tell it to you so you, you people are educated and you know. And then when you hear it, you see, you'll see it on the internet. You'll say, no, no, I, he told it to us. One day, and this was, by the way, Smithsonian Magazine called me this year when they had their 50th anniversary thing about the jet. Said, your story is the single most popular SR story in history. It, it, it is. So would you please write down when it was in the magazine? I said, wow, I, I believe it because everywhere I go, people are saying. So I'm going to tell it to you right now and you better listen carefully. <laughs> One day, Walter and I are doing a training mission around the United States. We take off out of, out of Sacramento, hit a tanker in Idaho, accelerate up to Montana, hit the high mock over Denver, hang a ride in Santa Fe, out over Los Angeles, up to Seattle, back into Sacramento, two hours, 20 minutes. And then you do it, do it backwards just to get, gain time and experience. It's just training, just a, a couple of refuelings in there. We made the turn at Santa Fe, and we're over Tucson. And I can see downtown LA from Tucson. And it's a, it's a beautiful late, late uh, in the afternoon, 6 o'clock October fall day. The whole western United States is bathed in a warm glow of, a, of a, just an October afternoon. Silence on the radio, smooth as glass, not a gauge moving in my cockpit. We're blowing cactus down 18 miles high. <laughs> and I'm thinking, we bad. <laughs> I'm looking in the mirror, oh yeah. <laughs> and I feel sorry for Walter. He's got to monitor five radios in the back seat. So I flip the switch up just to listen to what he's doing. Now those of you that fly know that Center controls all the traffic out there. Albuquerque Center, Jacksonville Center, LA Center, all, all around the United States controls you when, you when you fly anywhere. We're above controlled airspace so they're not talking to us but they have us on their scope. And sure enough, everybody in those days, there wasn't GP, uh, GPS, they all want to know their ground speed. There's some Cessna guy, got to know his ground speed. Hey, LA Center, Cessna, November Alpha, Tango, you got a ground speed readout for us? Now, Center would like to say, hey, pal, who cares? Get off freak. <laughs> but he's not going to say that. Now, if, uh, those of you that fly know this is true. Center will talk to you like you are somebody. Every guy at Center sounds like the same guy. You could be Joe Bag of Donuts on your first flight or John Glenn, you get the same voice. <laughs> Cessna November Alpha Tango, we show you 90 knots, nine zero knots on the ground. And they sing it like that. It's, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. And right after that, a twin bonanza came up on Freak, I guess, to show the guy at real speed was. And LA Center, Twin Beach, uh, you got a ground speed readout for us, you know. Center's rolling his eyes like, oh, it's Friday afternoon, why me, God? But he is going to talk to him like he's Air Force One. <laughs> Yeah, Twin Beach, we show you 121, two, zero knots on the ground. And right after that, a Navy F-18 had a Lemoore popped up on frequency. And you could tell it's a Navy guy because he talked very cool on the radio. <laughs> Center Dusty 5-2 speed check. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Dusty 5-2 has a ground speed indicator in that million dollar F-18 cockpit. Why are we calling center to broadcast our speed? Oh, I get it. We are just the meanest, baddest, fastest military jet in the valley today. We're taking our little Hornet jet over Mount Whitney and ripping through Death Valley and we want everyone from Fresno to the coast to know what real speed is. And you can almost hear a little glee in the controller's voice like we have put an end to this kind of an etiquette thing. Dusty 5-2, we show you 620, 620 knots on the ground. And there was a hush on frequency. There was an airliner from Seattle to San Diego that wanted to be next on frequency. <laughs> and a 12-year-old was reaching for the mic button. <laughs> and I said, oh no, Walter's in charge of the radios. We had all the simulator time. I used to fly single seat. Now I'm in the family model. We have a division of duties. And a, no, but it's the Navy that must die and it must die now. I said, no, but if I say anything, Walter will be upset. I want us to be a good crew. And, I, and at that moment, I heard a click of the mic button in the back seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter and I became a crew at that moment. <laughs> Walter, in his very best innocent voice, uh, Sinner, Aspen 30, if you got up. <laughs> ground speed radar for us. <laughs> you could almost hear a collective gasp on frequency from everyone else like, oh, the poor fools. They, you know, it's just a, a, an etiquette thing. <laughs> Center had to give you that same voice. They couldn't go, gee whiz, wow, we, oh, hoo, ah, yeah. No, it had to be that same voice. <laughs> Aspen 30, we show you 1,987 knots on the ground. <laughs> And 
And when I knew I was going to like Walter for the next four years, <laughs> when he came back and said, Senator, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want you to know we did not hear another transmission all the way to the coast. So what do combat hardened commie fighting fighter pilots do when they retire? I shoot pansies now. And, uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I uh, am opening a gallery in California of my nature photography and my jet stuff. It's an eclectic mis uh, mix. Our motto is from butterflies to blackbirds. So you should get that. It's very cute. I will end with this last story. I have a little special video to show you. It's on takes three minutes. So I think I did pretty darn good on the time because I was told you will be you know hung by the neck till dead if you go over. <laughs> If you, a lot of you get what I'm saying tonight and you say, yeah, Brian, we agree with you. Attitude's everything in life and it, it obviously affected your life and we understand. We get it. A lot of you have gone through difficult times m much more than I. And I would just leave you with this one last thought. When you come up in other, against an obstacle and this, this building itself, this company, what you guys do here, there, there's obstacles and challenges and, and hurdles to come overcome all the time. When you come up against one that you see no way around, just remember that one day an SR-71 took the runway at Kadena Air Base, swung that long black nose out of Taxiway Alpha, rolled down the runway, sat there for 30 seconds waiting for its exact takeoff time. And the pilot of the aircraft that day could look out his little window on a 153 degree heading for 3.6 miles, could see the roof of the hospital he had laid in 12 years earlier. Wow. And on that day, Legend has it that the SR-71, instead of climbing straight ahead over the South China Sea to hit the tanker, made a hard 90 left turn at the end of the runway in full burner, 300 feet. Some say much lower. <laughs> <laughs> Buzzed a certain soccer field, sending kids falling to the ground and <laughs> crying and screaming and waving and yelling and running and throwing the ball and rattled every window in a certain hospital without breaking one. And as that big black jet made an arc back to course, now the entire base was awake. It was as almost as if all things had come full circle for that pilot. And he could understand for the first time in his life the meaning behind some of the events that had transpired in his life that he couldn't possibly understand. Uh, I'm just honored and privileged to be a part of this prestigious uh, place where, where dreams still, still come true. Thank you very much.